The sermon title for the 20th Sunday after Pentecost is called Illusions of Grandeur, and I'll explain that in a little bit. The Bible seems to be full of boys who are the center of their mother's world. We have Sarah and Isaac, Hannah and Samuel, Ruth and Obed, and Elizabeth and John. At the top, of course, we have Mary and Jesus. Yet there is another mother and son pair whose history is much darker. The two are Eve and Cain. The name Eve means life. Yet from the woman named Life came the first murderer and the first death. The name Cain is related to the verb to get, Eve thought that in her son she got the promised Messiah. She took all her guilt and sadness from the Garden of Eden and turned it into a kind of hero worship. Instead of using psychological terms like delusions of grandeur, let's just say that Cain grew up with illusions of grandeur. He was the ultimate mama's boy living in Eve's fantasy world. In Eve's eyes, Cain could do no wrong. This led Cain's descendants to be self-righteous, prideful, evil killers. Genesis chapter 4, verses 23 to 24. Yet they were very skilled so that other descendants of Adam would do business with them and even marry them. Genesis chapter 6. Cain was a farmer like Adam. He grew the food that the family ate. He was important. Abel, the younger son, herded sheep for their wool and milk. Back then, people did not eat meat. Abel was the brother who got picked on by at least some in his family. He had a tough life. When Cain and Abel made offerings to God, the Lord shattered this fantasy about Cain. God accepted Abel's offering. How dare he? That brat did not amount to anything. Cain's anger began to burn inside him. God warned Cain, but he paid no mind. He killed his own brother, whom he had bullied from the start. Then when God asked about it, Cain asked, if he were his brother's keeper. Think zookeeper, as if Abel were just an animal. Cain became the first cry bully. This word has become popular in the past decade. For years now, people whose parents are multimillionaires have become journalists. These rich kids use the media to target middle-class people and bully them. When the middle-class people take these journalists to court, these rich kids cry on TV and play the victim. Cain did the same thing. The bully became a crybaby when God confronted him. His illusions of grandeur, the fantasy land that his mother made for him, disappeared. Jesus also tells us, a parable, so that we do not become cry-bullies like Cain. Pharisees were the conservatives of their day. They thought that they were better than everyone else, like some who live strict lives today. In a traditional prayer, they thanked God that they had not been born women. In their minds, they were the only men who truly followed the Lord. Yet Jesus called them whitewashed tombs, Matthew 23, verse 37, because they set works over faith. The Pharisees were a lot like Cain. We compare the Pharisee to the tax collector. The King James Bible calls him a publican, a public servant. To be a tax man in Roman times, you had to collect at least what the Roman government wanted in taxes, but you also added a surcharge to create a living for yourself. This tax man had enjoyed the extra wealth and power. 
yet he became cut off from his own people, almost like Moses. See Exodus 2. He lost his way with God. Remember that Matthew, also called Levi, had been a tax collector. Jesus' parables tell real-life stories. This tax collector realized that the money was not worth it anymore. He was lonely and broken. In that way, he was similar to Abel. In fact, the tax collector was bullied in a way by the Pharisee who mentioned him in prayer as being the scum of the earth. Yet amid big, wet tears and a nose full of snot, the prayers of the tax collector reached the Lord. God received those prayers as he had received Abel's offering. God heard them like he had heard the blood of Abel cry out. God was pleased by the sniffling prayers of the tax man. He was not pleased by the silky prayers of the Pharisee, who knew all the right words, but had neither faith nor love. Paul was once a Pharisee. Then he met Jesus on the road to Damascus, and everything changed. The man who persecuted and killed Christians, Acts 7.58-8.3, to 8, 3, now preached the gospel and was himself persecuted by the authorities. What a conversion! Yet Paul makes a little comment how he was abandoned by believers when he was called before a tribunal to plead his defense, 2 Timothy 4, verse 16. Although he prays for those who he perceives as his betrayers, he still feels hurt. Remember that Jesus also was abandoned and betrayed, and he told Ananias that Paul will be shown how to suffer for his name's sake, Acts 9, verse 16. Paul is not going against that, but he is reacting in the same human way that we do. He sees the bullies of this world swoop in to target him, and he does not like it. He is a regular Christian like us. But that is the point. As Christians, we have the same earthly blessings that the non-Christians have. We have much the same sins as they. We have much the same likes and dislikes as they. Have you ever met a Christian and wondered, does he or she really go to church? And yet, in faith, amid our brokenness, amid our snot and tears, we can approach the Lord and get something that the pagans do not have, forgiveness. As with Abel, God will look upon us for Christ's sake and be pleased. That is all because Christ lived, died, and rose for us. There is no room for pride before God's altar. There is no room for holier-than-thou people. There is no room for people who live with illusions or delusions of grandeur. But there is extra room for sinners who have been knocked down like the tax collector. There is extra room for those who weep and call upon God to forgive and to help them. For faith and humility, there is always room. Now it is time to wake from sleep, for salvation is nearer to us now than when we first believed. Romans 13 verse 11. If we imagine that we are holy, we are dreaming much like the Pharisee. When we awake from dreams, our sleepy illusions of grandeur, we see that our deeds look a lot like those of the tax collector. That means we need to approach God in the manner of the tax collector. Like Paul, we can become uncertain. Yet, in that moment, we call out, O oh God, help me! Amid our snot and tears, we fix our eyes on Jesus, whose death in our place has freed us to new life in the gospel. In him we gain worth. He wipes away our tears, hands us his hanky, and sustains us until we stand in the company of Abel, Paul, the tax collector, and the Lord Jesus himself.
and the peace of God which passes all understanding. Keep your hearts and minds in the one true faith in Christ Jesus unto life everlasting. Amen.